Good to see you everyone. My name is Robbie Howell, tabletop role-playing game designer, lover of history, and lifelong player of Age of Empires 2. And if you've been watching my channel since way back in the day, you would know that I love African history. I was just getting back into AOE2 when the African Kingdoms expansion came out, and it was mind-blowing and wonderful. One of the things that really sucked me back into the game and made me thrilled to see its resurgence, even more than I already would have been. And in honor of that, today we will be remaking one of my personal favorite civilizations of all time. A civilization that I've been wanting to see get into AoE2 since I learned that the game was still going way the hell back in 2012. And that civilization is... The Malians, which I have rebranded as an archer and monk civilization. Huge thanks, as always, to my mod squad for providing consultancy on the feasibility of various bonuses in my builds. I didn't have to talk to them too much on this one, but they've been great in the past, and they will be great going forwards, I am sure. Let us move on, as always, to a brief summary of my approach. On this channel, we focus on historical authenticity, trying to be truer to history than the game currently is, capturing the feel of a civilization within the confines of the game, and trying not to step on the toes of existing civilizations which I do briefly in this one. I am trying to stick with what is implementable in these builds. If you see me do something that is impossible, let me know. And if you want to see me push the boundaries, skip to the Lavant Guard section towards the end of this video. Of note, I am a hobbyist, not a historian. I have to simplify all the time, especially true with African history, and I am often wrong. But all of my sources are linked in the speaker notes of this slide, presentation linked down below, and images are credited likewise on every slide they are shown on. If you want to support me, please do leave a comment. I would love to hear your thoughts, as well as, like all the YouTubers say, like and subscribe. Join the Discord server linked down in the description below, and if you have a couple bucks to spare, donate to me over on Ko-Fi. Before we jump into the build, another very brief disclaimer that I want to make mention of West African history is rough to research. And that's because while they brought in plenty of Muslim scholars as scribes, most of West African bureaucracy during the Middle Ages was conducted purely verbally. They did not take notes. Much of what we know about Mali, for example, is from second-hand accounts, such as famously Ibn Battuta, who I am going to be referencing a lot in this particular build, though archaeology and like study of later related states can also teach us a lot. But all of these are indirect. For example, for the Malians, we still don't even know for certain where their capital city was or whether they even had a capital city. There are many like major contenders, but we do not know for sure. Uh, also of note, I do not use Wikipedia when I am doing research. I know Wikipedia has an extensive page on the Malian military. I've combed through it before, but when I was doing this build, I could not source most of the claims that were made there that would have been relevant to change my build. So in summary, take all of this with a big gigantic chunk of salt, because when it comes to history in general, and West African history in particular, nothing is set in stone. Or salt, or gold as it were. Let's begin with a summary of who they were. Who were the Malians? Well, specifically, they are the Mandinka ethnic group, also called the Malinke and the Mandingo, and many others besides. Uh, they were prevalent across much of West Africa since at least 700 AD, probably earlier, and they primarily worked as middlemen in the gold, salt, and slave trade, connecting the fertile gold fields of southern West Africa to the trade routes that would take them north across the Sahara and vice versa. They were prolific before their empire rose and well after it fell. And this made the Mandinka people quite wealthy even before the Mali Empire took off. Because of this, I really feel like this civilization should probably be called the Mandinka or the Malinke instead of the Malians. If you would like me to change the name, uh, please go vote. I've released a pair of polls in tandem with this particular build. Uh, I think Malinke might be slightly more accurate than Mandinka, whereas Mandinka is what they use in the campaign. So I could see either of those names being valid. Now, once the Mali Empire itself actually rose, it was a pretty freaking substantial one. The largest West African power up until the Songhai Empire 
empire which supplanted it. And part of the reason for its success could likely be attributed to the social structure of the Mandinka people even before Mali. They were a hierarchical people with a very complex society. They had a hereditary monarchy since their early days in the state of Kangaba, which is very unlike their many neighbors who were much more egalitarian in their social structures. Uh, as a fun fact, Kangaba actually has the longest unbroken dynasty in West Africa and one of the longest in history, 1300 years of one cohesive line. Mandinka society comprised of a three caste system with the Oronu, or free men, including all nobles, warriors, farmers, and everything between. The Nyamakalo, who were the professionals, the artisans, the poets, etc., who were kept separate and seen as both powerful and to be respected, but also kind of polluted and tainted. And so they kept to themselves. Uh, and then the Jono, who were the slaves. And all three of these castes were very largely endogamous, keeping to themselves and marrying within their own kind. Uh, and also the Mandinka were very enthusiastic Muslims since the 1100s AD. Though, like everywhere in West Africa, they had plenty of animist influence blending in with their Islam as well. Now let's talk about the history of the Malians. Uh, beginning all the way back, like mentioned, in the 700s AD with the establishment of the state of Kangaba in kind of the southwest of what is now the nation of Mali. They were a vessel to the great power Wagadu, or the Wagadu Empire, or the Ghana Empire, as it is also called, and contemporary to other powerful city-states like Gao. If you want to see what my take on Wagadu would be, go take a look at this build up here, the Wagadugans, which I later renamed to the Soninke. But Wagadu was not to last forever, and once it began to crumble, Kangaba started making territorial claims in the 1100s AD, and it was these territorial claims that made them clash with the Soso kingdom, also former vassals of Wagadu. The Soso would win these conflicts and rule over Kangaba for quite a few decades before a successful rebellion in 1230 led by Sunjata, featured in the Sunjata campaign, would give Kangaba its independence. The climactic battle of Krina was what capped it all off, after which the Mali Empire was formally established by Sunjata Keita. The new Mali Empire quickly began to secure nearby holdings across its subsection of West Africa. They took gold fields in the south, key cities along the Niger River, and pushed back nearby rivals in all directions, including the Mose in the south, Gao along the Niger River in the east, as well as the Tuareg Berbers up in the north. Within 100 years, it had reached its greatest extent, ruling from modern Nigeria to the Gambia and as far south as Ghana, an absolutely vast territorial expanse. Taking the Tagaza salt fields up in the north was the cherry on top, another immense source of profit that allowed the Mali Empire to skyrocket in terms of its treasury. And this stupendous wealth was what put them on the world map, after of course Mansa Musa's famous market-crashing Hajj all the way to Mecca, after which Malian embassies were permanently established in both Morocco and Egypt, as well as a few other places around the Islamic world. However, by the mid-1300s, a little bit after Musa's time, cracks were starting to show, and their decline in earnest started in around the 1400s AD. In 1440, Gao rebels, leading to the rise of the Songhai Empire, and other Malian vassals quickly seized upon this weakness. Takrur and the Wolof in the west, as well as the Mose in the south, rebels soon after and cause serious problems. Then the Tuaregs come in from the north and take a bunch of key holdings, but the Songhai came sweeping in and kicked out all the other rivals, pretty much taking over everything that Mali had controlled by about the 1500s AD. Uh, Mali pulled its borders all the way back to Kangaba, the original kingdom that started it all, but Kangaba did pretty well for itself up until it was assimilated into later greater empires past the AOE2 time frame. Though of note, a rump state of the Malian Empire called Kabu actually made it all the way to the 19th century. And later European studies of Kabul allows us to infer some of what we think we know about the medieval state of Mali itself, since a lot of Mali's practices were preserved in large part in Kabul even after they were lost across the rest of its old territory. So where are they now? Where are the Malians now? Well, the Mandinka slash Malinke people are still prominent in West Africa today, and even Kangaba is still on the map, though it's a very minor player. Uh, and naturally, the name Mali survives in the modern state of Mali, covering much of the territory that the mighty empire once ruled. An incredibly consequential state, arguably the definitive medieval West African power. 
Let's talk about flavor, the beautiful aesthetic details that make Age of Empires civilizations special. And I'm glad to say the official Malian civilization does a great job on this. The language that we have now is Eastern Mandinka, which I think is actually quite a good language for them and seems reasonably well researched. Uh, the Ensign, I would personally keep for now, though if I were to change it, I would probably make it to do something with this flag you see down below, which seems to be like a semi-accurate reconstruction of a flag that Mansa Musa himself potentially brought during his Hajj. So I'm strongly debating changing it because the current ensign is kind of like generically West African rather than being nice and specifically Malian, but you guys tell me, again, this is the other thing I have a poll on. Go vote over in the community tab of my channel if you have strong opinions as to whether I should change the Malian's ensign or keep it as is. But uh, let's move past that. Architecture, African, woohoo, nice and easy. Wonder, I think the current one, the Great Mosque of Jenne, is great. I would not change that whatsoever. And the castle, I would also keep, though mostly for lack of better options. It's really hard researching medieval African fortification. So they can keep their castle for now. With flavor out of the way, let's talk about campaign. And while Sunjata really is the obvious pick for a campaign protagonist, for want of more options, I am going to toss Mansa Musa into the ring as well. While this fine fellow was best known for crashing the gold markets and going on his famous Hajj, he was also a very successful king in and of himself. He fought many enemies, such as the Mose, the Hausa, and the Tuaregs during his journey towards Mecca, uh, and he of course interacted with the Islamic world on more peaceful terms. So while you would definitely want to have his Hajj as one scenario in this campaign, there would be plenty more to do on the military front. Uh, that being said, uh, Sunjata Keita is pretty much the best pick that you could hope for uh, with a Malian civilization. Uh, like I said, I put Musa here for a variety, uh, because civs should totally be able to have more than one campaign each. I'd love to see two or three per. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you had to only go with one, Sunjata is probably the correct pick. If you want to see some additional AI player name options, take a look on screen right now. I've come up with some pretty cool ones. Uh, but with that being said, let's move on to major themes. Whenever I study a civilization, I try to find major overarching patterns that I can use as major goalposts when I am crafting my build for them. And for the Malians, here's what I've come up with. First of all, economic prosperity. So they had a strong pastoral and agricultural tradition. Compounded by their wealth and other resources amassed through trade, they became absolutely loaded. Multiple visitors to Mali remarked on the great abundance of the land, not even talking about the wealth, like just the land itself seemed particularly fertile and fecund. And there was this really fascinating belief I found where the Malian people, even great kings like Musa himself, had this belief that a land's productivity was tied to its native inhabitants living there. Hence, if you conquered a land and kicked out the locals, the land would stop producing. And so therefore, because of this theme, I wanted to see awesome economy with great endurance to that economy, going well into post-imperial age. Another major theme, decentralization. What the heck do I mean by that? Well, most of the Malian empire at its height was made up of autonomous vassal states. The Malians themselves only brought force in selectively to keep taxes flowing. This is again related to those beliefs I was just talking about on prosperity. So if you conquered and displaced a people, their land would go fallow. And so because of this, they had a very laissez-faire sort of attitude towards economy, governance, and even military, mostly just allowing their vassals to do what they were going to do unless they started doing naughty things. And this was kind of similar to how they treated Islam. They were described by Ibn Battuta as being enthusiastic Muslims, but very far from orthodox kind of allowing the religion to spread and evolve from the bottom up rather than like imposing strict rules from the top down. And so because of this theme, I wanted to give them strong incentives to spread out their base and take a lot of land, putting a big emphasis on town centers to represent kind of provincial self-governance, as well as give them an unconventional but effective monastery. The last major theme I want to talk about though is shows of force. The Malian Empire was very strong and had a huge army at its height with plenty of victories to its name, but it often didn't need to use that army. They mostly fielded archers with an expensive kind of heavy cavalry corps at their heart. Their bows weren't particularly powerful and their horses had to be imported at great expense to the ruler, but being able to field a huge army by some accounts numbering as much as 100,000 men often won battles before they were even fought. 
And so because of that, maintaining these expensive soldiers was as much for show as it was for actual practical strategic reasons. That being said, the Malian army did start to lag behind at the end of their empire due to, I would argue, a lack of practice, as well as the fact that they didn't really spread their forces very much. They kept them quite concentrated and only kind of sent them where they needed them, meaning that once a bunch of different rebellions started to pop up in a lot of different places, it was very hard for them to put out all the fires effectively. So because of all this, I wanted to give the Malians an archer focus with a cavalry sub-theme to represent their primary historical army comp, and push them towards death ball comps, with individually subpar units in the late game that when you group them together, become very, very scary, if kind of immobile and hard to separate out. Now, that brings us to the end of the history section, if that's all you're here for. Thank you so much for watching. But if you, like me, love Age of Empires 2 and want to see what I've done with the Malians, let's move on to Civ Design. Beginning, as always, with an official civilization review of the real Malian civilization. Let's talk about the good. They have a great tech tree. I only made a couple of changes outside of the stable, which I changed a good bit. And overall, I think that's really commendable. Uh, I actually really like the theme the real civilization has of having like a perfect castle age and a poor imperial age tech tree. Uh, and while I haven't kept that precisely, I was inclined to keep rather close to that vision because I find it compelling. I think the gold bonus is apropos, though I think kind of overemphasized. And I think that their unusual cavalry dynamics is repped okay. I think the university tech speed bonus and the wood discount bonus are both in kind of the right direction, if a little bit simplistic. And overall, though, something I forgot to put on this list, I think that their flavor is great. Like, some of the best actually in-game, between their wonder and their language both being perfect and their castle and their ensign being, like, fine, that's really, really good. And I love to see it in an African civilization. It would have been so easy to half-ass all of that. Now, as for the bad, the Gabedo is laughable. It's one of the worst historically grounded units in the game, and clearly was just there to try to like blend together a bunch of cool ideas and hope no one noticed. But I do, and I don't like it. Uh, I also have no idea where the infantry armor thing comes from. Maybe it's to do with like the African quilted armor, but that was mostly for cavalry. Uh, but the biggest problem is trying to cram a whole damn region into a single civilization. It's clear that the current Malians are trying to just represent all of West Africa, presumably because the devs had no idea when they'd be able to come back here, but even so, I will never personally favor this solution. So overall, my grade for the official Malians is a B. I actually think it's a top 10, maybe even a top 5 civilization in the game in terms of historical authenticity. Uh, there is some questionable stuff that reeks of Wikipedia, frankly, uh, but it is otherwise inoffensive, and it only has two very fixable big problems, the Gbedo and cramming all of West Africa into one sip. And both of those we are going to be fixing today. So honestly, commendable effort. Nicely done, official dev team. Let's go over an overview. The Malians, an archer and monk civilization first bonus. Town centers and castles spawn three free archers when built. Now, this is trying to reference a couple of things. First of all, uh, the majority of their army comp being archers, but also the Mandinka Horonu cast, uh, like I mentioned, encapsulated everything from farmers to warriors to nobles. So you have uh, like a farmer's building, the town center, and a noble building, the castle, both generating warriors, since all of them shared a cast. Second bonus, gold lasts 25% longer, other resources last 10% longer. Yes, I know this is kind of ripping off the Mayans, but I think it's very dumb that they have that bonus. As friend of the channel, You May Crab, said when I quizzed him on AoE2 trivia, go take a look at that up here if you haven't seen it before, that's the sort of bonus that is only really justified in, oh, they were a very resourceful people, rather than having any sort of substantive grounding behind it. Whereas for the Malians, they had the famed abundance of their land and their beliefs surrounding abundance being tied to indigenous occupancy, which I think works really, really well for this sort of bonus, with obviously an emphasis on gold. Next bonus, Jolly Aura benefits archers. For those of you who didn't see my Sungai build, uh, the Jali is a new regional unit for West Africa, sometimes better known in English as a Grio, uh, a bard-like figure in noble courts of West Africa. The Jali I will be getting into a little more later on, but for now, uh, suffice to say that they have a military-focused aura that normally doesn't benefit archers, and this bonus lets them benefit archers. This is because the bow was a symbol of authority in Mali. The twanging of bowstrings was reported by Ibn Battuta to be a sign of approval, kind of like applause during court. And archery skills were a notable point of praise in songs to the king and other nobles. So between that and their archer focus, I felt like this was a very appropriate bonus. 
Last civilization bonus, monastery technologies researched 80% faster. Like I said, they were eager adopters of Islam, though not necessarily orthodox, hence why, as you'll see later, they do not have a perfect monastery, but still quite a good one. This is also referencing the current university tech speed bonus, which I think is, again, in kind of the right direction, but monastery is honestly more appropriate. Lastly, their team bonus, the first monastery built spawns a free jolly. This means that your allies can get Jolly, uh, even if they can't make any more. And the Jolly is quite an interesting and powerful unit, meaning that I anticipate this being quite a strong team bonus. The Malians were good allies to have. And this team bonus is mostly referencing their extensive foreign embassies within the Islamic world. They were the only West African power to actually have real presences in foreign courts well up north across the Sahara. And because of that, I felt like having the Jolly, these ministerial court bards, be their ambassadors in foreign lands was super thematic and would incentivize your whole team to build monasteries to get some of the Jolly's powerful bonuses. I'm really pleased with that one. I think it's quite well-rounded. Now, with their bonuses out of the way, let's talk about their one and only unique unit, the Farraria. This is a heavily armored cavalry archer trained at the castle for 60 wood and 95 gold. Very expensive. It's tanky, but bad for micro, and it buffs nearby cavalry with an aura. Here's the stats if you want to take a look on screen right now. Suffice to say, it's almost as tanky as a knight, but is much worse than a cavalry archer for things like micro, with a terrible attack delay and a poor rate of fire. Its aura, eight tiles long, gives plus three attack to cavalry and plus one to cavalry archers. Wow, that is a very substantial buff. Uh, the aura does not affect other Fararia, and it does not stack with other Fararia, but it does stack with the Jolly, meaning if you have a Jolly and a Fararia, uh, you're going to be getting a shit ton of attack. Now, if you compare the Fararia to a Centurion, which is, I think, the most natural comparison, the Fararia affects more types of units with its aura, uh, and it has a bigger DPS buff overall in most situations, because plus three attack is way better than plus 20% rate of fire, usually. Uh, and it's also slightly cheaper, plus having a ranged attack, meaning it's often going to be safer. However, it is also much less tanky. Uh, it has way worse individual stats, like Centurions can, can stomp armies flat. The Fauria is not going to be able to do so very easily. Their aura doesn't boost move speed, and they have a slightly slower train speed. So overall, I think they're rather comparable to the Centurion, and in my estimation, probably wouldn't be overpowered. Uh, this effect really might seem terrifying, but I promise you the Civilization Stable compensates for it. There are some serious misses because I wanted to make Cavalry a sub-theme that are interesting and unique, but flawed in many ways. And the Fararia is really the only great Cavalry thing that they have going on. Uh, Fararia were Cavalry commanders who carried ceremonial bows and quivers, which they may have also fought with. Uh, they were obeisant to the Musa himself, uh, and while not, like, vast in number, there were definitely en enough of them that they could be spread nicely across an army. And unlike the Centurion, you're not going to be ever wanting to mass these things up to fight with them individually, so it's not like you'll be making, like, 50 of these things, when in reality there probably were never more than 16 or so. Uh, cavalry was a very big part of the Malian army, but like I said, horses were almost always imported and therefore very expensive. So cavalry corps were used as much for prestige as for military effectiveness. Hence why I wanted a cavalry unit with a lot of pomp and splendor, wielding the bow of authority symbol of Malian leadership. Now, the Ferraria upgrades to Elite Imperial Age for 800 food and 1,000 gold, quite expensive, uh, and gets quite a few substantial buffs, including plus 30 HP, plus 1, plus 1 armor, more loss, more attack, more aura range, and plus 2 more attack to cavalry, and plus 1 more for cavalry archers via its aura. Wow, that's plus 5 attack to cavalry. You know what else gives plus 5 attack to cavalry? Mm -hmm. The current Farimba technology, which is what this unit is trying to replace. Speaking of Farimba, let's move on to unique technologies, because Farimba ain't here. The Castle Age unique technology for the Malians is Banco. This allows destroyed buildings to return 33% of their cost. It costs 150 food and 100 wood, very cheap, and takes only 30 seconds to research, making it very quick to pick up. Uh, and Banco was beaten earth reinforced with wood the primary building material of Mali, as well as their neighbors in West Africa, which you see referenced in their various buildings. It's also clearly being referenced in the current Malian wood discount bonus. 
Now, Banco was very laborious to upkeep because it's, you know, it's mud. It keeps, it will dissolve over time and you'll have to shore it up. But it was very cheap and it was easy to reuse the materials. Additionally, Banco was adopted not due to a lack of wood. Mali had plenty of wood. It also had the ability to import extremely fine hardwood from the south but from a lack of good stone, which was what they really had trouble sourcing and they really needed in order to build nice big things like castles. Hence why we don't really have any examples of actual Malian castles in history. Moving on, however, to their imperial age unique technology, Faren. This allows town centers to fire plus eight arrows, identical to the current Tigui technology. And it allows town centers and castles to train archers and knights that cost 33% less gold. Whew, pretty nice. Faren, however, is pretty expensive, costing 500 food and 400 gold. Uh, and the Faren, or Farba, as they were also called in some sources, were regional military governors assigned to particularly unruly or strategically important provinces to keep the peace and enforce taxation. The Faren, I should also note, had their own small standing armies and could levy more as needed, hence my wanting them to be able to train archers and knights. And since, of course, the Mali Empire was famed for keeping very large numbers of these very expensive troops subsidized by the king himself, they get a gold discount in the process. Next, let's talk about regionals. There's a couple to mention, including two familiar faces and one newcomer. First, the Jolly. I'm not going to go into full detail on this one. Like I said, that you can see more about them in my recent Songai build. Click up there if you want to see it in full right now. But to summarize, the Jolly is monk-like, but cannot convert. Instead, it has two auras, one boosting work rate for Vils, the other boosting attack for infantry and cavalry. They would be available to a bunch of West African civilizations, Malians, Songai, and my earlier builds, the Soninke and the Mosse. Now, the other technology I want to talk about is salt mining. This is a new regional technology researched at the mining camp in feudal age for 125 food and 100 wood. It allows stone miners to generate 33% gold in addition to stone, identical to the current poles bonus, though of course you need to research it first. Uh, this would be available to many civilizations, including but not limited to the Sogai, my Soninke, my Venetians build, the current Poles, and many more besides. Also giving Poles the ability to have a cool new bonus in the process. Salt was arguably more important to West Africa than gold. Whoever controlled the salt in West Africa usually controlled West Africa, especially the fertile salt fields of Tagaza in what is now Northern Mali. And because of that, it is just silly to me that salt mining is kept exclusively to the poles with that one bonus, when frankly, West African civilizations were way more famed for their salt production than Poland or frankly anywhere else in the world ever has been. So salt mining, new technology, and not just confined to West Africa. Lastly, the Malians would receive the Genitor, uh, which would be identical to how they are now. Uh, I'll be talking about further availability for the Genitor in an upcoming video, but for now, suffice to say, they'd also be available to the Songai uh, and also the Mose. Now, with all that out of the way, let's talk about some tech tree grades. Spirit of the Lost, I'll beginning with infantry. It's a C minus. No champion and no halberdier, that's kind of rough. No blast furnace, blows. They don't have blast furnace, just like the current official version. They do have the jolly, which do buff infantry, but even so, maybe at best you could give them a C. Next, archers, it's an A minus. They miss hand cannoneer, they miss Parthian tactics, and they miss the elite genitor, as well as bracer. But they get free archers from their TC and castle bonus. They get the jolly buffing archers uniquely. And they also have Faren allowing them to train cheaper archers from their castles and town centers. This gives the Malians a rather unconventional playstyle with archers where you can field like a ton of kind of weak ones, go for a massive power spike in late castle early imperial age, or try to clump them together and rely on the jolly to up their damage output, even if their range kind of suffers. I think overall it is still deserving of an A-. Hopefully I have done my job in making an actual archer civilization that misses Bracer. <laughs> Cavalry. It's a B. No bloodlines, no husbandry. Ooh! As well as no paladin and no blast furnace. Oh god! Ah, you're killing me, Robbie. I know I'm killing you, but bear in mind, they have the Jolly, which buffs cavalry attack in an aura. They have the Fararia, which majorly buffs cavalry attack in an aura. They also have Faren, which lets them train discounted knights. I think you can see why I'm not giving them lower than a B. That has the potential for some disgusting attack stacking 
though admittedly very fussy and with some serious weaknesses. Come to think of it, the archers also kind of benefit from the Ferraria, but only with the cavalry archer and the Genitor, so I think I'll keep that at an A-. Anyways, cavalry, B. Another very unconventional take, kind of like their archers. Siege, it's a B-. minus. No siege onager, no bombard cannon, no siege engineer. Pfft, not great, but still they have siege ram. Next, defenses, it's a B. They have every castle age technology available in the university, and no imperial age technologies besides chemistry. They also like bracers and hoardings. Eh. But Banco lets them refund a bunch of resources, including precious stone. And they have Faren, which of course lets their town center fire arrows and also lets some of their key defensive buildings train great units when needed. So overall, I think a B is reasonable. Maybe a B minus. Now, Navy. It's a B minus. No cannon galleon, no shipwright, no bracer. Uh, but everything else is there. So you can still go fast fire ships and have a grand time and your war galleys aren't terrible in Castle Age by any means. So mostly generic, but a pretty complete tech tree overall just held down by a no bracer. Economy, it's an A. They have every ecotech in the game besides the stone mining line to represent their lack of good quarryable building stone. They do have salt mining, however, to compensate. So stone income is going to be doable and get you some extra gold, but it's going to be slow. They also have the Jolly, which they get for free from their monastery bonus. They have Banco to refund some resources when needed. And on top of all that, they have the longer lasting resources bonus that they semi steal from the Mayans. So overall, I think you can't justify any lower than an A for the economy. Very strong, definitely the crowning jewel of this civilization. And lastly, monks. It's an A minus. Like I said, they have an unconventional monastery, much like their unconventional archers, cavalry, and navy. Woohoo! Uh, but they're missing block printing and faith. Block printing hurts, faith doesn't really matter. They do, however, once again have the Jolly, which spawns for free from the monastery, even though it's normally trained from the castle, I must emphasize. But they get one for free from the monastery, their monastery text research much faster, and the Jolly does benefit from sanctity and fervor. Meaning that the Jolly is really the reason for this A-minus grade. The monks themselves are far from bad, besides block printing, they're great in castle age, and you will be able to get the technologies for them that are relevant much, much quicker, which can help from time to time. So overall, A-minus. And now that we have an idea of their tech tree, let's move on to an overview of my intended game plan for the Malian. Starting with early game, it's a C. They have an almost entirely generic dark and feudal age, particularly with a subpar scout rush due to lack of bloodlines. They do have the long lasting resources thing, and that definitely helps out a bit in early game, but it really only starts to pay off in mid and late game big time. So overall, I can't justify higher than a C between a worse than average scout rush and an eco bonus that isn't going to do a ton until the late game. Though it will help with your food income, so that's something. Mid game, A+. Excellent Castle Age tech tree. They have four misses, the stone mining techs and the stable technologies. They get free archers and free jolly, so it's easy to protect yourself while you are booming. The Ferraria aura is big in castle, even with your subpar cavalry, they're gonna be doing more damage than any other cavalry in the game. But of course, kind of fussy, and you have to work around having very squishy and slow cavalry, even if they are doing a shit ton of damage. And on top of that, your longer lasting resource is gonna be starting to kick in. You have a ton of options across your tech tree. You are just in great shape in the mid game. My intention was for them to have one of the best mid game in the game. Late game, it's a B plus. They're missing blacksmith technologies. Do suck. Yeah, that hurts. But it's compensated partially by auras and great variety in power units. They also have awesome sustainability. They have longer lasting resources, refunded buildings, cheap power units through Faren. So overall, they will outlast a lot of civilizations even if they can't out damage many of them. They do have some tech tree misses, especially in like the defenses department but none besides the smith techs, which are compensated by auras, are really crippling. So overall, more broadly, you have, as the Malians, some great power spike to potential in late castle and early imperial age that you need to be capitalizing upon. You have an awesome endurance, though your power does fall off in late game, and your reliance on auras and low army speed necessitates a death ball. You have a lot more trouble raiding in the late game because you, you really can only maximize the power of your archers and your cavalry if they are near your aura units. So you really have to take a more direct approach, which is going to limit your strategic options, but is still going to give you some good power if you can keep things together. Uh, a mixed army is strongly, strongly incentivized. You really do need to mix in a lot more units and can't just min-max a single unit to win the day like other civilizations can. 
Now this brings us to the end of the design section. Last up, loose threads. Some other stuff that didn't quite fit elsewhere in the builds, beginning with some uncertainties. Um, my first uncertainty with this civilization is whether it's underpowered. It doesn't really have much of an early game. And while the longer lasting resources is nice, it just might not be enough early. On the Mayans, it's obviously very strong, but remember, they also have a free villager, and I'd argue that's a much better eco bonus, especially early. Uh, their weak early game is well-grounded, but I don't want them to be helpless, so I think maybe a little early game buff could be necessary. What do you guys think? Uh, also, Archer Civ without Bracer. Is it even possible? I've really tried my best. I love how the current Malians miss Blast Furnace and Bracer. I really wanted to do something with that, but still have Archers be the focus, as is historically appropriate. And it is true that Malian bows were not very powerful, they just had a ton of them. And the weakish Archer Swarm identity is certainly unique among Archer civilizations. I just don't know if it's enough. Uh, the cavalry are in a similar boat. They might just suck too much. Uh, I want them to be uniquely strong and uniquely flawed, even more so than the archers, though in a different direction. Um, and the big aura boosts are a cool payoff, but even then it might just be too weak. Uh, and also yet another aura. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, I'll be changing my Songai build to have uh, less auras uh, next time I feature them. Um, I might even be able to remove two auras from them. So don't worry, it's not, I'm not just going to spam aura civilizations in West Africa. That is not my intention. Uh, and I know that two West African civilizations with an aura unique unit, um, even if those are very different units and are kind of foils to one another, might be seen as kind of like lazy and trite. Uh, lastly, I'm not really a huge fan of the Banco unique technology. Uh, it might work better as a regional tech for all African or West African civilizations, um, but it doesn't really... I don't know, it doesn't quite do it for me, and I don't love the defensive direction it pushes a civilization in. They really should not be defensive. Um, the Caravanserai was a consideration uh, as well. Um, I found a, another interesting option that I'll talk about uh, shortly that might work better, but would probably be too complicated for now. Um, some alternatives. What if they started with a free trade cart? Like, obviously in single player, that's pretty much just like a scout. Uh, in team games, it would mean that, you know, maybe you get trade going a little earlier, but it's mostly going to be a scout. And I think that could be a really cool and creative early game option um, that would be a small boost and reference their, their extensive existing trade network in history. Um, also, maybe the archer spawn thing from TC and Castle could also happen when you hit Feudal Age. Eh, I don't know. Might be just too much spawning. Um, and also, the what if the Ferraria aura boosted speed to compensate for missing husbandry? I, again, I think it's kind of lazy, but... I could see it maybe being necessary, especially if the cavalry just suck eggs. Um, unfortunately, an armor boost to compensate for lack of bloodlines isn't doable via an aura yet. And even if it was, I don't know, I kind of prefer them being on the squishy side for, for cavalry, even though they are you know, fully armored up. It, it's still just a, a cool idea to me. Make them more susceptible to spears, less susceptible to bows. Now, uh, let's talk Lavant Guard. Uh, that is the impossible, improbable, and often idiotic, but innovative ideas that my channel was once known for, and now I reference at the end of videos here. I have a whole ton of different tech tree ad options. Read through them at your own interest and convenience. Uh, the ones that I wanted to briefly highlight uh, would be uh, a series of two unique technologies, uh, Dugutigi and Wulatigi. This is the master of earth and master of bush. These are like local uh, authorities of small communities who were respected by imperial power because it was partially through them that a land's abundance uh, was was preserved. And I thought it would be cool if those were like feudal or even dark age unique technologies that allowed the, the longer lasting resource effect to kick into play. Another one uh, would be the Funduk, which is a regional building, which is like a merchant's warehouse that the Malians would share with Berber civilizations like the Tuaregs and the Moroccans. Uh, which we will have builds on them eventually, I promise you. Lastly, uh, I will once again highlight the Knife Thrower, Sahel Cataphract, War Drummer, Tirke, and War Canoes that I mentioned in my Sungai build. I also mentioned several of these in my How Much Can We Add to West Africa video. Go take a look up there if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, all of these would be awesome, awesome additions, but would probably just be too much for now. Uh, don't worry, I will consider them for future. I just felt salt mining was the most important one. Uh, I also had some tabled mechanics, such as the free trade cart thing or the upon advancing to feudal age spawn two free archers thing that I mentioned earlier. But other than that, I don't think any of these come anywhere close to supplanting the ones that I have on my version of the build. And with that, we come to the end of this Malian's redesign. Thank you guys so much for watching. Before we conclude, let us take a look at the rework likelyometer. In my opinion, how likely is it that the Malians will someday be reworked, maybe looking a little bit like this build here? And on the rework likelyometer, we have 
a 4 out of 10. I think it's a possibility, uh, though kind of a remote one. The Gabeto seems to be kind of well-liked and iconic, even though it's stupid. Uh, and I think that, personally, that seems to me to be the most likely change they could make, would be to remove the Gabeto uh, and make it like a scenario editor exclusive option and give the Malians a more proper, unique unit. Um, I would be kind of surprised if they did a more substantial remake, though very pleased, especially if they took it in a more archery direction, as I think would be more appropriate to history. But that's just what I think. Now I want to hear what you guys have to say. How'd you like the build? What would you do differently? Do you think that Molly even needs a rework? I, I don't think it's super high on the list, personally, considering it's one of the better historically grounded civilizations in the game, but it's one that I personally love, and I love the subject matter around, so I wanted to tackle it a little out of order to match the rest of the West Africa thing we've been having going on recently. And along those same lines, what do you want to see me tackle in future on this channel? More West Africa or other regions besides? But until then, my name is Robbie Howell, and ciao for now.